open to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Do remain standing if you if you can. With our missions conference just a couple of weeks away, I didn't mention that earlier, but um, two weeks from Sunday, we'll begin our missions conference. Hope that's on your calendar, you're thinking about it, and just looking forward to a, uh, a good time in the Lord. It'll be Sunday through Wednesday, but with that just a few weeks away, I want to I look at a portion of scripture which is um, perhaps the most in-depth um, section of scripture uh, on, the, on the subject of giving, and um, really want to talk about generosity, biblical generosity, and how to have a proper understanding and a right spirit about uh, giving. And my goal tonight is not to try to persuade you to be a giver or to give more if you're already giving, but just to try to help us to understand really the um, God's heart and what biblical generosity looks like. And um, this passage that we're going to look at is uh, not what we would look, not what we would think about typically as like tithing or giving towards the ministries of the local church, the facilities, and those types of things. It really is missions giving. Um, these churches that he's talking about, they're giving offerings to other churches, to uh, churches in um, in Jerusalem and, and others in need, um, which is what we're, we're going to be thinking about really in the next couple of weeks. So, um, but but the principles about giving that we're going to look at will I think apply to everybody. Uh, I got a little echo up here. If, maybe just turn the monitor down, if you would, just a little bit. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse number 1, and we'll read the first nine verses. 2 Corinthians, is that what I said? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll begin in verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia... How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that he, as he had begun, so he would also finish in you with the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye, through his poverty, might be rich. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for your word. Help us, Lord, tonight to... To the best of our ability, Lord, to block out the things that would try to keep us from hearing from you today. Help us, Lord, to block out distractions, things that have been on our minds today. Lord, I pray that just for the next short time, we would focus solely on your word and what you would have to teach us. Help us, Lord, to be ready listeners and just to understand your heart for this very important subject. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. 2 Corinthians, as you know, is a letter that was written from the Apostle Paul under the influence and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to a church in Corinth. And in this particular passage, he's referencing and he's commending another group of churches north of Corinth in Macedonia. And these are churches, the ones in Macedonia we're familiar with, churches like Berea and Thessalonica and Philippi. And what he's saying in verse 1 is, brothers, I want you to know all that God is doing through these churches north of you. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed 
on the churches of Macedonia. And he's going to go on to show a pattern of what biblical giving really looks like. And so we're going to look tonight at some, some characteristics of biblical generosity. What does it look like? Not just to give, not just if we give, but how we give, how our attitudes are as we give, how our spirits are as we give, what motivates us to give. And are we giving with the right spirit? Jesus said, it's recorded in Acts, but Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Galatians says that if we sow sparingly, we'll reap sparingly, but if we sow bountifully, we'll reap bountifully. And so we know these things in our minds, and yet sometimes it's challenging to get those truths from our minds and really believe them with our hearts. And so tonight we're going to look at six different marks of biblical generosity from this passage. Six different marks or characteristics, and we won't spend very long on any of them, but you can jot them down and look back through them later. Number one, biblical generosity is the result of God's grace. And as we're going to see throughout this entire lesson, this really is the foundation of what Paul is saying here. God's grace is the foundation of our generosity. It begins with the grace of God. Moreover, brethren, verse 1 again, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And if you just read that one verse, you might think that Paul was about to tell them all the blessings that were being poured out, all the generosity that was been given towards the churches of Macedonia. I want you to know about the grace of God that's bestowed on these churches in Macedonia. But what he's actually going to say is, rather than all that those churches were receiving, we know the grace was bestowed on them because of the way that they were giving to others in need. Notice how he begins this long passage about giving by saying, we want you to know how God's grace is poured out on them. He's commending the church, but he's really pointing to the fact that it's not really the church that's doing it, but rather it's God's grace working through that church. Giving, as God intends it, biblical, scriptural giving, is not something that we talk ourselves into or that the preacher talks us into, but rather it's something that God does in us. And through us. It's God's grace working itself out in us. And so when we understand that, there's no boasting in our giving. When we understand that our giving is really just God's grace working through us, then we don't look at our giving statement at the end of the year and say, wow, I am really a super giver. This church, <laughs> I don't know what they would do without me. I don't even know if they would survive. Because we realize that it's not us that's doing the giving anyway. It's God, his grace, bestowed upon us, enabling us to be helpers to others. This applies really to everything that we do. It's not us that does anything good. It's God's grace. Paul said as much in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, when he said, By the grace of God, I am what I am. This eliminates comparison it eliminates us from trying to compare and make sure that we're doing more than somebody else, outgiving somebody else. But rather, we're just a conduit that the Lord can use to be a blessing to other people. Isn't that wonderful to think that we could be a, a channel? We sing that song sometimes, channels only. A channel that God can use to be a blessing to others. There's nothing that we do that we can boast about or brag about. God's biblical giving is God's grace flowing through us. It begins... And is a result of God's grace. And we'll allude to that throughout the message. But a second mark of, of this giving, biblical generosity, we might call it grace giving. You've probably heard that term. Is this. It continues even through challenging circumstances. Grace giving continues even through challenging circumstances. Verse number two. After he writes that this... The grace of God was bestowed upon them. He says, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. We understand affliction. We, we can all understand it. I, I don't know that we understand it in the same way that these churches understood affliction. If you think back 
a little bit and, and you're reading about these churches, you, you'll remember that Philippi, one of the churches that he's referencing, was in Macedonia. And if I were to ask you what you remember most about the church of Philippi, you probably would recollect the time when Paul and Silas were out preaching. And preaching the gospel, and they were publicly beaten, dragged, and imprisoned. And, and later they were singing at midnight, and the earthquake came, and the Philippian jailer got saved. It's a wonderful story, but that's what happened to believers in Philippi. When you preach the gospel in Philippi, you were publicly beaten, imprisoned. And so they left Philippi, Paul and Silas left Philippi, and their next stop was in Thessalonica. And they were preaching in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17 or so, and... As they were preaching there, the th everything got so intense that they actually had to sneak out in the middle of the night and get out of Thessalonica because the persecution was so great, and they went from there to Berea. So this is the kind of affliction that we're talking about that Paul is writing and commending them because he says, in the midst of their great affliction, all of the persecution that's going on there, they're continuing to give. These were not easy places to be followers of Christ. And he also references their deep poverty in verse number two. This adjective deep describes more than what we might think of as just living paycheck to paycheck, as some of us no doubt are. This is beyond that. The, the word poverty it, it actually means beggarly. So it carries the idea of somebody who's out, who has nothing, doesn't have a home, doesn't have food. He's out begging on the street corner, begging for his next meal, begging for anything to put clothes on his back. And, 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 and Paul says, even in your great affliction and your deep poverty, it's really amazing. They continued to be generous, liberal, liberality, great trial of affliction, deep poverty in them produced extreme liberality in their giving. Even when things were at their worst for them, their, continue, their giving did not stop. Their generosity did not stop. How is that possible? Because, again, generosity is nothing more than God's grace working through us to do that we could not otherwise do. Originally, for this point, I had that... Biblical giving is unaffected by life circumstances, but I don't know that that's really accurate because circumstances may have an effect on our giving. If you lose your job for four months, the amount that you're giving on a weekly basis will, may, will, will probably change. But generosity doesn't stop just because hard times come. Generosity doesn't stop giving. The act of giving, the act of generosity can continue even in the midst of the most challenging circumstances as it did for these churches in Macedonia. And, and this, this giving that Paul is commending the Macedonian churches on is not normal giving. It's, this, is not, this, is not, this is not normal behavior, otherwise he wouldn't have pointed it out here. It's not, it's not normal for people to give in this way. Christians, uh, Non-Christians can be givers. Do you, do, you know any, do you know anyone that would, that, you, that would not claim to be a follower of Christ, but they are a generous person? You probably do. There are people who give millions of dollars to causes, and we would say that is not a Christian cause, but they're still giving. You can be a giver and not even be a Christian. But this kind of giving is much different, as we're going to look at shortly. Tough times are going to come. Some of you are in the middle of tough times now. But difficult circumstances do not, does not stop the grace of God from working in our lives. In fact, in fact, God's grace can often be shown in a much greater way when we're going through the most challenging times. When I am weak, he's strong. He shows himself strong on our behalf. When we're strong, he often is kind of hidden away. We kind of hide him away, but when, it's when we're weak then he is strong within us. Biblical generosity is a result of God's grace. It continues, number two, even through challenging circumstances. A third trait of biblical generosity is this. It's voluntary and joyful. If you read verse two, to me, the word joy kind of jumps out of the page. 
because that word doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the words in the verse. Let's read it again, and notice how joy just doesn't seem to fit. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Sandwiched in between affliction, trial of affliction, and deep poverty, we see abundance of their joy. Despite their circumstances, they were able to be joyful givers. It's really something, isn't it? You would think in their position, being so impoverished, just having food to eat would, be, would, would bring them joy. They're not think, they wouldn't be thinking about what they could do for somebody else because they're barely having their own needs met. And yet what's bringing them abundant joy is being a giver, putting out, seeing God's grace work through them that they can give what they have and even what they don't have. To be a blessing to others. That's the effect of grace giving. This instruction about giving flows over into chapter 9 as well. We won't look at it now. But chapter 9 and verse 7. Uh, Paul writes. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth. What kind of a giver? A cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. If you ever find yourself. Back when we had an offering time, or maybe walking back to the offering boxes and you pull cash out of your wallet, or you write a check, or you give online on your phone and your teeth are gritted and you're just saying, man, I can't believe I'm doing this. And you're thinking about all the things that you could be buying. And you're angry because you're barely having your own needs met. Just know that that's not the kind of biblical generosity that we're looking at here. This is giving that's willing to, that's cheerful, that's happy, that's thrilled that I can be a part of the work of God around the world. Notice the attitude that we see in verse 4. Praying us with much entreaty that we should receive, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. They were begging Paul to take their money. Which leads, that's what, he, that's what he's saying, praying us with much entreaty. Which leads us to believe that Paul was, was sort of resisting taking their money. No doubt because he knew that they didn't have any money to be giving. And so Paul's saying, I don't know what he's saying, but they're, they're having to say, Paul, take our, we, which we want you to have our money. And Paul is saying, you don't have any money. And, Paul is, and they're begging, praying us which, with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Because they wanted to have a part... In ministering to the saints. Verse 4. That's what it says. Take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. We want to have a part in what's going on across the world. You're taking money over there. We want to be a part of that. We want to send. what We don't have much, but we want to send what we have. And we're going to do it with joy. Giving, just like any of the other graces of God, can lose its joy. We can go through the motions, and, and just like we can lose the joy of study of God's word, we can lose the joy of prayer, we can lose the joy of, of singing in the church, we can lose the joy of giving as well. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. He can restore our joy. Look in verse 8. I speak not by commandment. But by occasion of the forwardness, of forwardness of, your, of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Biblical giving is joyful. Biblical giving is voluntary. We do it not because we have to do it. We give because we want to give. We have a desire to give. When, when it becomes strictly obligatory, we only give because I know that I have to give. Every week I have to give. And so I'm going to put my money in the offering box because that's what I do. It loses its joy and it's no longer Biblical generosity as God intends it. Our giving ought to be voluntary. It flows out of our love for Christ. It flows out of our love for others. Notice the phrase that we just read in verse number 8. It proves the sincerity of our love. It's one of the ways that we prove that we really do love our Lord. Our giving is the result of our love for God, our desire to see the gospel go forward into all the world. Look at verse 5. This they did, not as we hoped. He's still commending this church. 
but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Before they gave their money, they gave themselves. Christians often get this out of order, don't we? We do all the things that we're supposed to do. We give our offering because we're supposed to give our offering. And we read the Bible because we're supposed to read the Bible every day. And we dress a certain way because we're supposed to do that. But it's all becomes drudgery because we've never given ourselves. We've never fully surrendered ourselves to the Lord. What Paul is saying, he's commending them not because they did this and they did this and they did this and they did this, although they did. But first, he said, they gave themselves. They fully surrendered themselves to the Lord. If we give our money before we give ourselves, then we'll be grudging givers. We'll become bitter resentful we'll see someone something that somebody else has and we'll say man i could give that i could get that too if i didn't have to give this money all the time i could have a nice car like that too if i wanted to but no i have to give every single week to my church we can get that way we can become resentful doing the right thing we're doing right but because we're not doing it in the right spirit because we've not fully surrendered to the lord we're doing it grudgingly out of necessity and then we we become bitter and resentful but these people first gave themselves to the lord that's why that's why they were so thrilled to give even in their deep poverty Even in their affliction, their trial of affliction, they were giving with joy because they had already given themselves to the Lord. They had already fully surrendered. What's what's the money? These Christians, they loved Paul. You can read about their love for him throughout this. In chapter 7, you can read about their love for him. But but, but we find them begging to give here in verse 4, not because how much they love Paul, but because they wanted to get in on the work of the Lord, to take upon us the fellowship of the ministering, to the saints. They weren't giving sacrificially in this way because they've been guilted into it by their preacher, old brother Paul, always talking about giving, I guess we'll give. No, no. They wanted to get in on the work of the Lord. They wanted to get in on this ministering of the saints that was happening. And so with joy, they're giving. They're gu- giving, joyful givers, voluntary givers. Number four, biblical generosity is sacrificial. We've already mention this but verse 3 really is powerful for their for to their power i bear record yea and beyond their power they were willing of themselves if there was one word to describe the macedonian believers it would be sacrificial they gave beyond their power if somebody gives it's good if somebody gives what they're able to give it's good when i hear about millionaires giving tens of thousand dollars to a cause, I think that's good. I'm glad they're doing that. But what's happening here is not giving what they can. This is giving more than they can. Would you agree that that's what we're reading? They gave of their, to their power and beyond their power. Beyond what they're capable of giving, they gave. <laughs> How's that possible? Again, because it's not them doing the giving. It's the grace of God working in them through a surrendered life. And now they're able to accomplish what they never could have otherwise accomplished. If we, out of fear and unbelief, never attempt anything that's beyond our power, then we're never going to recognize the power of God in our lives in the way that they have. They fully surrendered giving above their own ability, and God somehow supernaturally allowed them to do it. Biblical giving is sacrificial giving. It's giving that costs us something. It affects our lives. It's giving that requires faith. If it's not a faith, it's sin. Can we give and not give a faith? Of course we can. We can give. We can put money in the plate and, and, and it have no faith, but God blesses faith. Biblical generosity is sacrificial. Number five, biblical generosity, here's some good news, is a work in progress. Look down at verse number seven. Therefore, as ye abound in everything... That's kind of a big statement. 
We need to abound in everything. Do good in every area of your life, essentially. As you abound in everything, in faith, he gives some specifics. In faith, and utterance, or speech, and knowledge, and all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. What is this grace? This is the grace of giving. As you abound in these other things, faith, utterance, and knowledge, diligence, your love, see that you abound in this also. Keep growing in this area also. We would never say that we've arrived in our spiritual walk, I would hope. We all have room to grow. And Paul is saying, just as you're seeking to grow in every area of your life, every single area of your life, we ought to be growing in the Lord. And just as we're growing in every other area, see that you grow in this grace also. We're to grow in our faith, he says. We should have a stronger faith now, if you're a Christian, you should have a stronger faith in God now than you did a year ago. You should believe God more today than you ever have before. Because the more God pr proves himself to us, the more, we, the more confidence we place in him. Our faith should grow. In utterance, he said, we ought to grow in our speech. Our words ought to be growing, abounding, becoming more courageous in our witness. Ought to be more kind in the way that we talk to one another. We ought to be growing in our speech. We ought to be more encouraging than we used to be. Not less encouraging. We ought to be more uplifting to our brothers and sisters in Christ than we were. Not less. We to be, we're to be bounding in all of these things, right? That's what Paul is telling us. We're to grow in knowledge, he says. We ought to grow in biblical understanding. It's a work in progress. We're always trying and seeking to understand his word more. We're studying it. We're meditating on it. We ought to be growing in knowledge, right? Every area of the Christian life, we ought to be continually growing, growing in diligence, he says. As we become more mature, we should not be less committed. We ought to be more committed as we mature in Christ. And so he's saying, he's saying all these other things... All these other areas, you, you know you ought to be growing. You ought to be growing in knowledge. You ought to be growing in speech. You ought to be growing in faith. You ought to be growing in diligence. Just as you're abounding in all of those other things, see to it that you're abounding to this grace also. Our, 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 the grace of giving in our life ought to be abounding, ought to be growing. What that tells me is it's a work in progress. God is, God is growing me. God, God is growing each one of us. He, he doesn't expect you to, be, to give by faith now. The day after you're saved, God doesn't have the expectation that you're going to give in the same way be, as you will in five years and in ten years and in twenty years. You're about to be growing. God help us if we look back and we say, man, I remember back then when I used to be so full of love with my words and now I'm not. And now I'm full of hatred and anger. God help me if back then when I first got saved, I was, I was full of love for people, but now I just don't have that love. I was so diligent back then in my service and in my, in my, uh, to Christ, and now I, I, I'm really not. God help us if we say, I, I used to give so faithfully, and I was so excited to be a part of the work of God around the world, and now it's a grudge. See that ye abound in this things, in this grace also. Do we get frustrated sometimes with our lack of faith? Do you ever get frustrated with your, your failure to use the kind words that you should or your failure to love people the way that you should? I'm sure that you do. I think all of us Christians get frustrated sometimes with the, the, the way that we live. And what he's saying here is that we're going to, let's abound in each one of these areas. Let's seek to grow. God wants us to grow. Gr giving is a grace. It's a grace from God. When you give, it's not really you giving. It's God giving through you. And that changes the way, that changes our attitude, I think. So number one, biblical generosity is a result of God's grace in our life. That's foundational. It's not us, it's him. If it's us, then it's not what God has in store for us. It's not what he has for us. Number two, biblical, biblical generosity continues even through challenging circumstances. It continues. It doesn't come to a stop. God's grace doesn't stop whenever external circumstances bring barriers into our lives. Number three, it's voluntary and it's joyful. We don't do it. We shouldn't do it because we have to do it. We do it because we want to do it. It's voluntary and we do it with a great heart. Number four, it's sacrificial. Number five, it's a work in progress. 
Finally, number six. Biblical generosity follows the example of Christ. I love verse number nine. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Paul has spent the first eight verses speaking about this church, these churches in Macedonia. He's writing to Corinth and encouraging the church in Corinth about their giving. He's going to continue that into the next chapter. And he's, and he's saying, look over at, at all of the, that God has been doing through these churches in Macedonia. He's using them in, as an example. But then in verse 9, he, he points away from them and he points to the, the greatest example of all, Jesus Christ. And he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was the greatest example. He was rich. He had everything. And yet for your sakes, he became poor. He gave up all that he had for your sakes that ye, through his poverty, might be rich, might become rich. You are the recipients of his sacrifice. He's the ultimate example of giving. Christ is the ultimate example of sacrifice. Christ is the ultimate example of generosity. There was no obligation for Christ to give himself. He had everything. There was no reason for him to leave the splendor and the riches and the perfection of heaven to come to this wicked earth. Humanly speaking, it doesn't, there was no reason for it. And yet, for love's sake, for love's sake, because he saw the world and our wickedness, and to prove the sincerity of his love, he gave himself, gave everything. This is biblical giving. This is grace giving. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he became poor. This, this is the, his example is the one we're to follow. I'm glad that we have the Macedonian churches. It's Christ's example, the ultimate example of how we're to follow. That, that kind of giving is not, it's not, it's not a grudging kind of gift. Now, does that mean that, does that mean that, we, cannot, we won't fall into the trap of this just monotonous act of giving? Probably not. We're all, we're all very prone to that. We're prone to going through the motions, aren't we? We're prone to just doing the act. But when we focus, what Paul is trying to do is saying, take your focus off of yourselves and put your focus on Jesus Christ and see what he did. Look at what Jesus did for you. He wasn't going through the motions. He wasn't, being, he wasn't obligated. He was not required. No one forced him to do what he did. He willingly gave himself. He left. He became poor. He was rich. He became poor. And you're the recipient of it. And now what Paul is saying is there, there are those in need all around you, all around the world who are poor. And you, through the grace that's been bestowed upon you, can become poor so that others can become rich. That's following the example of Jesus Christ. It's not seeing how little we can get away with. It's not comparing ourselves with somebody else and saying, I'm glad I'm doing more than he's doing. I'm glad I'm doing more than she's doing. It's not boasting about what we might have done. None of that, none of that is grace giving. Grace giving is recognizing that it's not me. Not, none of this is me. Nothing good that I do is me. It's all, all that I am is because of the grace of God. A genuine love for God, a genuine love for the world, a genuine love for sinners will drive us will drive us to be generous Christians, generous people. God help us not, not just to give, but to help us to have an attitude that would be honoring to God. Help us to have a growth mindset. I'm not, I'm not where I need to be. I'm not where I know God would have me to be, but I just want to keep abounding, keep growing, keep growing in every area. About, see that you abound in everything, he said. Abound in your love, yep, I need to grow there too. Abound in your utterance, yep, I need to, yep. My knowledge, yeah, that needs to grow too. Every area, every day, growing a little more, a little more. And while you're growing in all these areas of the Christian life, see that you abound in this grace also. That is the grace of giving. God help us to be students of his word and followers of his word. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you left 
heaven, you gave up everything. You had everything and you gave it all up. You became poor. To even imagine the God of heaven becoming poor is hard to wrap our minds around. It's impossible to wrap our minds around and yet that's what you did for our sakes. And you are our example, the ultimate example that we're to look to. Lord, I pray you'd help us to look to you, not to just, not to just check all the boxes, Lord, but to have a heart like the, the Macedonian churches did, Lord, to want to please you, to want to see others helped and encouraged, to want to see the gospel go forward. God, help us to be generous people, generous Christians, a generous church with a spirit of joyfulness and sacrifice and generosity and and voluntarily, Lord, giving of ourselves, giving of ourselves first, and then see what you do in us.